uh, okay, what I'm trying to uh, do today is, you know, just introduce you to some of the conceptual issues about poverty and also at the end come to poverty in India. Uh, so let's start with, you know, suppose we say India is a poor country. Is that right? What does that mean? India is a poor country. Do you all agree? Huh? Yes. Uh, we are supposed to be some third in GDP and we are supposed to be quite a rich country uh, in some respects. But when we talk about poor or poverty, uh, I think the first question is, what do we mean? Who is poor? Right? And that's what we're going to be discussing today. Uh, because India as a poor country means in some way there are a lot of poor people, whether in absolute terms or relative to our population. So then the next step is um, identifying who is poor and who is not poor. Uh, right? Then we can count and measure in some way what is the degree of poverty. So any idea any of you, any of you have had, I mean you must have heard about seen and obviously poverty around you, but who is a poor person or what is, how do we define a poor versus a non-poor? Okay, so annual, yeah, annual income below a certain amount. I won't say 50,000, I mean, this is a, uh, you will come and see what it is in India, you'll, you'll realize it's, it's a poverty line is much lower. So what does that mean? That you're saying that a person who does not have enough income to, I mean, why 50,000 or 5,000 or whatever number we agree on, on what basis? Does not have enough income to do what? Basic needs. Yeah, gosh, this is a, this, you've done a lot of economics, I think, many of you. Okay, so in some sense, it's a, if when you say there's not enough income, it's income to meet certain requirements and what those requirements are uh, will come to. So when we talk about the whole, you know, identifying or uh, measuring poverty, the first step is what is called identification. That is, who is poor, who is not poor. This may be on the basis of an income poverty line. Uh, it may be on a basis of some other criterion. Uh, you know, having a house and not having a house. So it's just some criterion and on the basis of that you say poor and not poor. And then the second problem, which is probably easier for all of you, is aggregation. That we have poor persons, uh, how do we arrive at an aggregate measure of poverty in a country or in a state? When you want to say what is the extent of poverty in Karnataka, it's not each person that we are going to line up, but we need some measure and uh, there's a lot of so each of these has a big literature around it uh, and I can only give you a flavor of some of the uh, problems that are discussed okay so when we come to identification okay so that there are several concepts Identification de depends on your concept of poverty, what you visualize poverty as. And the most important and which is also uh, the one which is the lineage which is followed in India is a biological approach. So what I mean by biological approach here is that does a person have adequate food for sustenance? So are you able to sustain yourself and live, right? That's the most important uh, criterion. If you're not able to sustain yourself, then you know, there's, no, there's no life. So a biological approach is something that has been historically, I mean, it's followed in UK and many other places. What is the, so when we're looking at what, who is poor, we're saying poverty is in some way related to whether a person can biologically sustain himself or herself. And that's why you often see 
in the literature, you'll see people talking about hunger, starvation, etc. Those are different concepts, but then some way related because we use this uh, biological approach, and I'll come to what we actually uh, do in India. Uh, there are many other approaches, but the second rather important one, and which is used um, in most developed countries like Europe or UK, is some measure of relative poverty. So when I talked about a biological minimum, it's a concept of absolute poverty. What we mean here is that it's an absolute minimum. Of course, it depends on, you know, a person living in a cold climate may require certain more requirements for sustaining himself than a person in a tropical climate and so on. But it's a kind of, we're saying there's a kind of absolute minimum which is part of that concept of poverty. And it will be easier to understand this if we think of the extreme opposite, which is relative poverty. And one extreme, of course, of that is inequality. Again, inequality is something you're probably all working with when you have some kind of distribution. So suppose we have a certain number of poor people in India, and every year the income of the rich is going up. So inequality is changing. But let's say this poverty is not. So if the number of poor people or the incomes of the poor people is not changing, then poverty is not changing, though obviously inequality is, because some people in that country or in that society are getting richer and richer. So your distribution, however you measure the uh, dispersion, is, uh, is getting um, higher. Now, in, in uh, the UK in particular, where there's been a lot of research on poverty and long history of economists as well, the idea of relative deprivation is very important. So it's not inequality, because inequality is distinct from poverty, unless we shouldn't confuse the two. Of course, they're related. You know, but uh, for example, in India, if we say there's growing inequality, then it may imply that you know poverty is remaining where it was; it's not moving. Only some other people are getting richer. But they're two distinct concepts. Is this clear? Poverty and inequality are related, but very distinct concepts. Okay. Just ask me any time you you have any uh, clarification. Uh, so, what do we mean by relative deprivation? So if you take the idea even of an absolute poverty, what is the minimum I need to sustain myself, or one could expand it to say to lead a life of dignity? Now, in a country, say in, in, uh, in a village, where not many people wear footwear, okay? at least some years ago, I think now it's changed, a lot of people are barefoot, then we may not say that our minimum requirement includes having a pair of shoes. But if you're in a cold country, then that is the part, becomes part of your absolute minimum. Okay? So, in, a, in other words, the society you live in, the kind of amenities and facilities and the needs of others determines in some way who is poor and who is not poor. Okay? So, it's not inequality. This, is, this relative deprivation is a little difficult, but um, uh, to give you a more concrete example, uh, in countries in India, we don't use this concept at all, so I'll finish with it quickly. But in countries of Europe, when they talk about poverty, they don't have the kind of absolute poverty that we have. Okay? They don't have large numbers, say, if you take Northern Europe or Germany. They don't have people starving, people having you know, no houses. Uh, people with no health care, very little education, and so on. So they don't have that absolute kind of deprivation. So they measure poverty in relative terms. What proportion, for example, of people earn below the median income or below the median wage? Okay. So the median wage obviously is sort of 50%. So the relatively poor in that society are those who are earning below that half mark. Okay, so this is something also that as we develop, you know, as our incomes increase, maybe we'll move to something of this kind. But as of now, the concept that is used is of absolute minimum. 
and in particular this very important point absolute minimum in terms of food okay. uh, what about non food we can't survive just with food okay. you have to get to your college you need transport you need clothes you need shelter okay so how do we arrive at a concept of what is the minimum non food requirements of a person okay. the food requirements have been worked out in rather detail by nutritionists medical doctors you know dietitians etc so if you're a girl of a certain age what is the nutritional requirement if you're a pregnant uh, uh, woman what is your nutritional requirement elderly man and so on so for each age group sex activity level we have quite detailed studies on what is the minimum kind of nutritional requirement of a person and uh, you know how many calories do you need to uh, not just survive but to continue uh, uh, living without uh, uh, okay to, to to have some kind of satisfactory uh, living but what about non food how would we arrive at a minimum of non food by non food i mean as i said transport um, health care education shelter even fuel you may buy the food but you got to cook it right so all the other expenses that are needed for survival now this is where it gets very tricky we don't have an easy way to arrive at non food and i'll come back to this when we come to india and therefore we tend to neglect it or you know just take some arbitrary um, assumption make some arbitrary assumptions about uh, non food okay uh, anyway to sum up what uh, i've tried to say so far is in the first question of identifying who is poor and not poor the approach there are many approaches but the one used in india is a concept of absolute poverty that is there's a certain absolute minimum that is required and then we can say a person who has that absolute minimum is poor not sorry non poor the person who doesn't is poor and this is usually linked to a some kind of biological requirements or food requirements of a person now before coming to how we measure this in india i go to the second question which is aggregation so we've been able to define a poverty line okay that is the cut off this let's say an income cut off those below it or less than equal to are poor those above it are non poor now how do we next aggregate and arrive at a measure of poverty so we have millions of people in india and we define a poverty line let's say 1000 rupees a month just just, just to have some idea how would we aggregate how would we say what is poverty in india it's not a trick question very simple the number of people yeah so the simplest measure and that's the only one i'm going to really focus on today is called head count ratio of poverty which is the number of people with income below this okay so you've got y1 y2 you've got the income of you know all the people in india and the number up to this let's say less than equal to z is q and the total number of people is f so this is very simple but this very powerful and this is the key indicator or a key sort of a measure of poverty used in india and elsewhere okay so it's called the poverty ratio or it's called the head count ratio so it is counting all the poor as a ratio of the total obviously ratio of the total population now so you have the income you have n people in india and you've just sort of lined them up in uh, you know ascending order of income and you say all those with income less than a poverty line what is a problem with taking something like the head count ratio 
as a measure of poverty. What? Uh, okay, this uh, uh, is usually defined as per person, or the term we use is per capita. Okay, so obviously, income of one thousand for a family of one. What she's saying is, income of one thousand for a family of one an income of 1000 for a family of 3 is not the same thing so family size is taken care of and it's usually divide, uh, defined poverty line is defined in terms of a per person okay so to adjust for for that to some to some way to uh, there are ways of adjusting uh, also and so on but what is the uh, what are we missing when we say any idea what the poverty this number in india is Poverty ratio, the poverty rate, headcount ratio. Any idea what proportion of Indian population is defined defined here? I'll say officially. So there are so many scholars, and each one has their own estimate. But officially, any idea? Five percent, ninety percent. I mean, what proportion of India's population is poor? Some number. Sixty. Huh? Okay, one number from this side and one from this side and then we'll move on. Okay, this side is saying 10. Huh? Okay, 46. Okay, <laughs> okay. Uh, 10 would be desirable. Uh, 46, I hope you're not, I mean, by the official count, it's about 25. 25.7. But I would say unofficially, uh, not unofficially, depends. We look at the definition, what's the problem with the definition, not unofficially. Depending on how you measure it, I'd say it's definitely more. Okay, so some people, it depends what, you know, as you can imagine, a lot of economists have spent a lot of time defining different poverty lines, and then you arrive at different estimates, but it could definitely be about 40 to 50. Okay, so that's the kind of number uh, I think is quite feasible, but the official number, I'll come to it later, is about 25, okay. Uh, so anyway, before coming to how we are measuring it in India, so what is, what do we miss out if we just take the headcount ratio? This is something that you mathematicians should be better at. So we've lined up people from Y1 to Yn, and we've just added up all the people here, okay. This person may be having income of 1 rupee. This person may be having just 999, right? So we are not looking in any way at the income gap. If we just count the number of people, we are not seeing how poor they are, okay? So this is the, I mean, again, there are lots of measures and I won't go into it, but the second major concept in measurement of poverty is what's called, not surprisingly, income gap ratio, where you're trying to, so you do something like, uh, I'm very bad at all this, but you'll be taking the gap with the, from the poverty line, okay? And summing it up, I'm, I'm not, I'm not writing all this properly, but, and then this may be squared, it may be cubed, there are so many measures, okay? Whether you take the absolute gap, and or you want to give more weight to those who are far away, then you square it, and or you go to higher order. Uh, there are lots of measures, there's lots of literature on this. But idea is that you, in some way, combine the number along with the extent to which, there's, you know, distance measures, basically, various distance measures, extent to which a person is poor. But you're treating somebody who's very poor, you're giving weight to that, some kind of weight, than somebody who's just a little poor. You know, near the poverty line. Okay, so if any of you are interested, there are lots of, you know, further measures and generalizations of poverty measures, and uh, that's one area somehow where Indian economists have contributed a lot. In the uh, maybe because we have poverty and people have studied it, but uh, starting from Amartya Sen, have some of you heard of him? He's India's Nobel laureate in economics. So his in fact, if there's one uh, reading, if, you know, I don't know if you circulate readings or something, if anybody's interested, uh, he has this book, a very famous book called Poverty and Famines, uh, written in 1981. 
Uh, but before going into famines, the first two chapters of this book are actually excellent exposition of what is the concept of poverty and how we measure it. Okay? And then now there are many, many papers and you know, you can do, you can imagine there can be a lot of combinations of these two and uh, a lot of possibilities for measures. But conceptually, I think that uh, if you read those two chapters, you understand what is, you know, how do we think of poverty? How do we measure poverty? Okay. So, so we've done both these steps and now I'm going to go to India and how we measure poverty. So if you have anything, any comment, question, clarification on this, is there? No? Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, so we have, uh, there's a long history of uh, measuring poverty in India starting of course just immediately and just before and immediately after independence. So the first poverty lines in India were in the, when the planning commission was set up in about 1950. And from then we have, you know, every few years we had till the planning commission was in place. Now it's replaced by Niti Aayog, which is not so involved in this. But every few years you would have a revision of what was our poverty line and what are the number of people who are poor. And I think there should be at least a couple of hundred, if not more, articles by scholars in this period between sort of 1950 and late 80s. After that, the sort of interest you know, waned a little bit on how to define, essentially on how to define this poverty line, okay? Not so much, and then something on how to aggregate it and measure it as well. Uh, now, let, let me, I'm just showing how to uh, start. Okay, now the thing is, so let's come to how would we define poverty. So let's say the poverty line is defined as the minimum, and here's a crucial thing which I have to explain, minimum expenditure required to meet subsistence needs, okay? Something like that is a definition. So an important, very important uh, point to note is that in India, all the estimates of poverty are based on expenditure, not income. Okay. Do any of you know the difference between expenditure and income? Expenditure is what you spend, income is what you earn. You know, it may be from your own salary, it may be from shares, it may be from remittances, from, you know, somebody sends you money. So the main, in, in uh, this is usually the um, expenditure or what we could also call consumption plus savings equals income. So what you don't spend, and you may spend on movies, on education, on health, on anything, okay? So what you don't spend is what you save, okay? So you could just think here, yeah, spend plus save, that's your total income. Now, there's a very, very obvious point here, that the richer you are, relatively, your savings are going to be more, right? Suppose there are two students who have, you know, your expenditure on your hostel, your food, etc., is similar. So one who is getting more income from home or a bigger stipend is obviously going to save more. So what we are doing by not taking income and taking expenditure uh, is that in a way we are ignoring the potential for higher income. Right? So what happens with savings? Savings can be invested, savings can be used later, savings could be used for higher education. So a person with more savings has a possibility of a higher income stream okay, at higher levels of income. So, and if you look at societies, whether it's India or any other society, the inequalities in income are much higher than inequalities in expenditure. And the richest people in India, how much can they spend? You know, even if 
they eat out in a five star hotel every day. So their savings are very high. So this is a very important point because when we come, so we are actually um, in measuring expenditure and I'll tell you why we do, we do that. But we have to note that while it is not comparable with any measure of poverty used anywhere else in the world, because everybody else uses income, okay, so we become non-comparable, that's one point. And the other thing is we are really, you know, only counting what is the actual spending, we are just leaving out some sort of potential for higher income. So see a poor person by this measure, and if you took a poor person by this measure, it would not be the same person, right? Well, you won't be capturing the same group. So anyway, that's a, I'll come back to that later if we want. So, is this the? So we have an organization in India called the National Sample Survey Organization, NSSO, which actually started at ISI and then I think in about 70s it was hived off and it became a part of the Government of India, uh, Ministry of Statistics. And they carry out regular surveys on expenditure, on consumption expenditure. Okay, these are very large scale surveys uh, over a lack of households, rural, urban areas, a very carefully stratified sample and so on. Uh, I won't go into that, but the NSSO, National Sample Survey, this is the source of data on expenditure from which the Indian poverty line is defined, okay? Now, NSS has a very, very detailed questionnaire. I think they have about 600 items. You know, how much did you spend on pan, BD, eating out, everything, okay? Entire household's expenditure on footwear, on clothing, um, on rent, whatever, okay? So there are different categories and detailed food and non-food expenditure, they collect information on that. Okay. And that survey uh, then gives us a distribution of all households in India, rural households and urban separately by expenditure class okay, or expenditure categories. And I'm going to give one example um, which is very old, but that was the <laughs> uh, classic example. So one of the um, so this is from 1961, but it's a classic book on called Poverty in India by. Uh, Dandekar and Rath. So the prices are a little different. I'll come to it. You have monthly per capita expenditure. Okay. So per month, the per person expenditure. So after doing this survey, we can identify the expenditure of all households and then we can convert it to monthly terms and per person terms. And now we can classify all households, say this is for rural India, in the level of expenditure. So this is in 1961, okay? Zero to eight rupees was the first category, all right? So I'll tell you what the, we'll come to the level now. But, uh, and you know how many households you know the average expenditure of this group, so 0 to 8 um, monthly group, the average annual expenditure was about 79 rupees and then so on. I mean, this doesn't matter. And we know what percent of the population is in this group. So 6%, 11% and so on. Anyway, so we can get all the other data we want, okay? So we have the expenditure level, how many you know, households are falling into that how, and what is the annual expenditure? 79 rupees per year was the expenditure of those in the lowest group. And why I'm giving you this is because the first poverty line was here at rupees 14. 
or 15. Okay, so in 1960, 61, a person with monthly expenditure of less than rupees, it was 14 point something that they decided to make it 15, was counted as poor. So how did they arrive at this? If you understand the logic, then you can take today's numbers and you can, you know, you can do it for any particular year. So, so for every expenditure group, so those spending between 0 and 8 rupees per month, how much did they spend on food? I mean, let's say out of 79, I, I didn't bring that table with me, but let's say they spent 60 on food and 19 on non-food. Okay, 79 rupees is the annual expenditure of this uh, household and we know we can count up how much they spent on food and how much they spent on transport and you know fuel, maybe they used firewood, they didn't buy any fuel and so on. But we can, we know the exact numbers, we can get how much they spent on, on food, on fuel, on transport, everything, we get all the items. Now you take only the food part and what the Government of India as well as Dandekar and Rath and others said is that for a person to survive in urban areas, you need 2100 calories a day, kilocalories a day. Okay? Some of you must have done some dieting so you'll know how many calories are, or have a calorie counter. So in urban areas, on average you needed this and in rural areas, because people are doing more manual work, etc. The idea was that you would need 2,400 calories. Okay. Now, let me clarify, this is the average. As I said earlier, pregnant woman needs more, a young child 0 to 5 will need less. And so, depending on your population structure, you have to arrive at the appropriate average. So, but let's not get into that complication. So this is the calories a person needs. Now in this survey on expenditure, they also, they know you bought eggs for 40 rupees, you bought, you know, 4 eggs and 10 rupees an egg. So we know the prices also. So based on available prices, an estimate was made, what is the cost of buying? Okay, spending, remember, because it's all on expenditure. What is the cost of buying 2,400 calories in rural areas? And that came to, as I said, this figure, uh, or whatever was the figure for this group. Uh, I think the 13 to 15 group was spending, uh, sorry, I don't have the food expenditure here. But let's say they were spending 100 rupees. So, if to buy that calories you need 100 rupees, then this class of people belonging to that expenditure class were just able to meet their food expenditure, the required minimum food expenditure. I don't know if this is clear. Shall I repeat it? Okay. Maybe I'll take a... I should have brought a more recent uh, number, but anyway. Uh, so we have the expense, we've done a survey and we have the expenditure pattern of all households. So we first separate the food expenditure from the non-food. Then we take, in order to buy 2,400 calories and very simple assumptions, like they would say 2,400 calories means some 100 gram of uh, carbohydrate per day, so much protein, so much fat, and that can be bought for 100 rupees, okay? So, anybody who got, who spent 100 rupees or more on food, as per the actual survey, was called non-poor. Anybody who was spending less than 100, so let's say these people are spending 60, they were spending 70, they're spending 90, and those in this 13 to 15 expenditure group were spending 100. Okay. In, in those days, we didn't get the unit data, so this we, 13 to 15 also we had to somehow, you know, find percentages and portion people. So 
all the people belonging to these expenditure groups, that is less than 15 rupees a month, are now called poor. Now we know how many in number they are, 6, 11, etc. In fact, in that uh, 60, 61, uh, it came to about 50 percent. 6, 11, 9, 9, uh, and so on. So we can count how many in absolute numbers and as a percentage are poor. So this is the basic concept of the poverty line in India. Um, and to this date, although there have been hundreds of economists working on this, there's been not much change. We're following the same concept, except that obviously we're not in 1960-61. Every year you say, okay, 19, I'll come to that. Uh, you can modify prices. There's inflation, you know, 100 rupees of 61 is probably 1,000 rupees today. So we, you know, we'll convert those into today's prices. But in terms of the concept, it's very basic. And this is the concept that is the line has gone up because every year there's prices are going up okay but the the concept behind the line hasn't changed so I'll come to the one which is used today is actually based on uh, maybe I should take yeah it's based on 1973-74 that was the year of the NSS survey okay we are still using this 1973-74 National Sample Survey, you know, did a survey. Again, all households expenditure was found out. They were all ranked by the per capita expenditure. And to buy 2,400 calories in rural areas, they said in 1973, you need rupees 49 per capita per month. Okay. Usually a poverty line is defined for a month and per person, per capita. And they said that in urban areas, you need rupees 57. Because things are more expensive in urban areas. So usually the urban poverty line is higher than the rural poverty line. In rural areas, some things like fuel, etc. You know, you spend time getting them, but that's not valued, so it's counted as free. So this is the today's poverty line. If anybody asks you, it is this poverty line. So it's rather absurd and personally I feel, that's why I said, uh, somebody said 50% that if we actually did a better measure, then we may get a different number. So from 73 onwards, what has been happening is that every year, not every year, but every few years or whenever, the poverty line is updated using different kinds of price indices and I won't get into that but a large part of the work of economists is on what prices should we use uh, food prices or should we use um, wholesale prices should we use uh, different prices like Karnataka prices may be different from Kerala prices should we use all India prices and so on you know there's a lot of index number work that goes on to get these that is to convert something which is in older prices something which is current, okay? But the identifying the criterion itself, the, the poverty line itself, it's only being updated, stopped in 1973. It stopped with whatever was identified in 1973. I'll tell you what the poverty line today is in a minute. There's been only then many, many of us economists, we wrote saying this is ridiculously low. Uh, okay, I'll come, to, I'll come to that in a minute. Um, and there was a lot of criticism about 10 years ago, not 10 years, yeah, about 2000, uh, that's right, about 2010 or so. Uh, all of you were too young to be reading newspapers, but there was a lot of, you know, discussion about agrarian distress, farmers' suicide, etc. Something's going wrong. We're not measuring poverty. And so a committee was set up uh, because all these are official poverty lines, right? They're defined by the government of India. So there's got to be a committee which is set up. 
And there was one committee set up, chaired by uh, Professor Tendulkar. And he said, it's true. I mean, his committee said, it's true that this poverty line looks very low. We're using a line of 1973. People's consumption habits might have changed. Nobody was buying mobile phones in 1973. Now it's probably, you know, basic minimum, you know, part of your requirement for, not just because when we say to lead a dignified life, if you need your mobile phone for work, then maybe that's also part of a minimum expenditure. So he said, yes, it's true that patterns of expenditure have changed since 1973. You know, there are things we are consuming today which didn't exist then. So using these poverty lines is a little absurd. But the solution that he gave was to say, OK, most people are complaining about the rural poverty line, so let's just use the urban. I mean, I don't know, this is how policy in India works. So today we have a single poverty line, which is rupees 57 per capita per month at 73.74 prices. I'll tell you what it is in today's prices. Okay. In, in 20... Uh, So now let's jump to today. But today I am going to have to tell you only about 2011-12. So that was the uh, Tendulkar committee, and it hasn't been revised after that. So in 2011-12, the poverty line per person per month was defined as rupees 816 in rural areas and rupees 972 in urban areas. Okay. So just think about this. Less than 1,000 rupees per month, if you, if you spend, you're poor. If you're spending more than 1,000, you're non-poor. Okay. Uh, and in the rural areas, it's assumed it's, you, know, you can live even more cheaply. So anybody spending more than 816 rupees per month would get counted today as non-poor. Uh, we haven't had a major survey you know, in the last few years. So when, when there's a survey of say 16, 17 or 17, 18, uh, these prices will be slightly updated. This may become 900 or and this may become 1200 or something. But you can see that I think all of you know this is absurdly low number okay but anyway let me let me come to that main criticism of that how much time do i have should i wind up i should 10 minutes but we won't have some discussion okay so i'll take a few minutes more by this uh, oh i'm sorry i'm sorry i gave you a wrong number uh, the states, the All India Poverty Line uh, Urban, I thought I was thinking, is actually 1,000. Okay. And it varies in different states because prices vary. And if we want to look at the number of people uh, or the percentage of people who were poor, then in 2011-12, the headcount ratio of poverty as I said, was 25.7 in rural areas and 13.7 in urban, and the All India average comes to something like 21. Okay. So by our official poverty line, about 21% of the Indian population is below the poverty line. It's about 26% in rural areas. and 13.7 or 14 in urban, okay, and uh, okay, I'm, I'm, uh, about 270 million people is the exact, yeah, 270 million in 2011-12, okay, and uh, this is the latest number that we have. Now, I just say one thing and then, you know, maybe if you have questions, I'll ask. See, the biggest problem here, as I see it, is where did we go? We looked only at food. 
and there's no minimum for non-food. So if you t say, I have to take a job to earn income, but I'm living in a village, I have to go to the nearest town, then the transport, that bus charge of say 50 rupees a day here if you go, go anywhere in Bangalore, that's, that's required for you to earn your income. So it's, you can't say that there's no money for that. So the non-food component in India, in my view, is, is arbitrary in the sense that, I mean, not in my view, in everybody's view, it's arbitrary in the sense that whatever you happen to be spending on non-food, we say is okay. There's no standard set in terms of what is the minimum non-food needed. Okay. And in addition to that, you have, of course, that even the food basket. Because you're not, a person's not going to just get their calories from eating one kilo of rice every day. You want to have a diversified diet. So you want to have fruits and vegetables, you want to have more expensive things. So how do we arrive at what is a, even a food requirement which is really, you know, more generous than this? And of course, the non-food where we don't have a norm at all. But uh, by this measure, we are able to show that about 20% or one-fifth of our population is uh, poor. Okay. So let me have some discussion now and then I can clarify. Okay, 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 okay. Uh, so ma'am, here we say that uh, basically we have been using the same system somewhat. So uh, at that point of time, be the same, not somewhat, absolutely. <laughs> okay. Same. So uh, basically, back in the 1960s, uh, we say that uh, about 50% of the population was poor. It's come down to 21. But uh, like, if we look at uh, what we perceive as being poor and all, like basically, poorer uh, poor people become poorer and the rich people become richer. So the gap basically increases. So what do you have to say, but the say for the relation between the two? Uh, yeah, this is what I said that. The gap between rich and poor, or gap between people, that is inequality. And that is not what we are studying, OK? And poverty is a distinct concept. Now, when inequality goes up, will poverty go up? Or when poverty goes down, you know, will inequality go down? Uh, this could go in many different ways. It's not necessarily the case that you know, the two move together. But what has been talked in recent years, particularly after uh, uh, liberalization and so on, is that whatever income growth happened in India, particularly in the, about a decade ago, we had a period of high economic growth rate, that that economic growth rate is being captured by a few people at the top. So then inequality is going up, but it doesn't mean that poverty is going up. The poor may be at the same level or you know improving marginally. So this relationship between poverty and inequality varies. And in fact, in um, some theories, people say that it's good to have a little inequality because only then you'll have those rich capitalists who'll invest money. You know, they'll have large savings. So there's a lot of theories about it. So it's not, uh, there's no clear link necessarily. But what this, although poverty of by our official measure is going down every year slightly, uh, it is true that whatever growth we are having is not reaching everybody. That's why we're still having, so in that sense, there is growing inequality. Some people are getting more of the benefits of growth. Okay. Yeah. Ma'am, does the government acknowledge the fact that we are just using uh, food as the basic uh, parameter? Because frankly speaking, it doesn't make sense, as you said. Because and there has because if you just take food into account for being poor or rich, there are several factors that also have to be taken care, even in terms of basic needs. If we just don't include, suppose, if, we, if I don't include transport, I still have to include at least shelter, at least something. So. No, it, these are all official committees, and they, you know there are a lot of very senior people, academics and economists, and you know planners who have writ written on this. So method is known to everyone. There's one sentence, you know, in a report of 1950s, which said that, you know, in the Indian Constitution and when it was being um, implemented, that education and health 
will be provided free by the government. So in a way, the people who are dis defining this said, we don't have to worry about education and health, because that's going to be free. So they're not going to spend, people are not going to spend on education and health, so let's not weigh that in. So there's one sit statement, but the only time I've seen it is in the 1950s. And then very recently, there was another committee after Tendulkar. So again, people were very dissatisfied with this uh, under the chairmanship of C. Rangarajan, um, who was governor of Reserve Bank of India and many things. And they tried to say that we must have some minimum non-food component. Uh, they raised the poverty line a little bit, but uh, I mean, not much. Um, but that hasn't been accepted, or that's not, uh, that's not the official. Yeah, the, the Rangarajan poverty line is about 1400. So they've increased it a little bit, saying you, know, you need some non-food items, but it's not a very big, big increase. Ma'am, um, yeah. let's say a country follows the concept of absolute poverty line. So uh, let's say the rich people are getting more rich. There is an economic growth. So one way of saying is that it is an economic growth because rich are growing more rich. However, the people who are considered poor, according to the absolute poverty line, are still poor. So in other sense, the economic difference uh, or the inequality is increasing. So in the discipline of economics, how do we perceive it? Is it a healthy economic growth or not? Uh, OK, this, I think this is the sort of similar to the question that was asked here. Uh, so definitely, I mean, it depends. In my view, you know, we shouldn't have any poverty. We should end poverty. So if that is one of your goals, then obviously you have to see whether it's through the economic growth or it's through the government intervention that you ensure that there are fewer and fewer poor people. And uh, in fact, in, uh, uh, in most countries of the world, like if you take where we, uh, just to give you an example, uh, we compare ourselves often with, uh, you know, India, as I said, is considered itself not a poor country at all. Uh, Brazil and Russia, China, South Africa. So if you look in China, it's less than 10%, 8% or something is their poverty line. In Brazil and Mexico and so on, it's 3% or less. So clearly their pattern of growth has been such that they have emphasized reducing poverty, which we haven't. Um, so, I mean, I, I don't know the term you use, unhealthy or whatever, but anyway, uh, yeah, I agree with you that we have not, in our path of development or path of growth, we haven't paid enough attention to reducing poverty. Ma'am, so uh, what are the solutions to decrease poverty? I mean. I'll have to come back for another lecture. <laughs> uh, I mean, the, uh, there are two things. One is that some of the non-food components, as we said, like health, education, shelter, these can be provided in kind. But the other thing is you have to raise the income in order to raise expenditure, because you can't perpetually have, you know, that the entire population is going to be given free food every day. Right? You can do that in pockets, you can do that for elderly people, you can do that for uh, disabled, you can do that for people who don't have an earning capacity, that you can provide the minimum food. But otherwise, you have to be able to generate income. So I think employment, I mean, we have a huge unemployment problem in India. Employment and raising incomes is obviously the way we have to go forward. Yeah. No, no, Sharon, yes. So this is about the sampling we take. So uh, when we take this survey, are we really considering this uh, migrant workers who are not really documented in terms of population? Because we provide free food and all depending on the ration card and those kind of things. So suppose a group of population is not availing these facilities, but then how will we treat them into this as a population hall? How will we t consider their accounts? Uh, so 
the national sample survey, they go by house listing. So they will only look at the residents. So suppose in a state, in a rural area, you decide that, you know, 5,000 sample is going to be drawn from rural Karnataka. Then it will be based on the uh, house listing records. So it's based on resident households. So in that sense, if there is a, the migrants are not captured in this kind of household survey. There are separate surveys that the NSS has done on economic conditions of migrants. But usually the household surveys, and when we say per person, so if you go to a rural household and they say one migrant is uh, working somewhere, working in Bangalore and sending me money, uh, that person is not counted there. So if they're in spending 1000 rupees, it's only being divided by the people who are actually residing. But if that migrant has sent home money, which they are using to buy food, then that is counted. Because they say we bought so much. Where did you get the money? We got it from a migrant. So um, they are not captured in the household survey, but remittances would be captured in some way in expenditure. Would be captured. Ah, you are talking about, uh, so in urban areas, uh, so, I mean, see, take uh, Mumbai, I don't know, some of you may be there. There are large, you know, settlements like Dharavi. So, those would be part of the sampling, I'm assuming. But if there are people in sort of uh, very temporary uh, shelters, you know, homeless, pavement dwellers, uh, then they're not likely to be captured. Okay. What about this side? Okay. Any other? Why aren't we using standard of living as a measure? Because we've known it for, like, we know this is a measure. We are using food line. Why is standard of living not used as a measure? No, there, there are different things. So there is, there are, as I said, there's a lot of discussion on poverty and uh, basic needs, which we you know mentioned in the beginning, and standard of living is linked to that. So the one view, which which I think, in some way, I subscribe to, is that if you took income, not expenditure, if you took income, income adequate income means adequate to cover all your needs. Okay, the thing is, we are defining needs in a very restricted way here. But in most other countries you have, for example, in the US, you have a poverty line. And some of you will be surprised to know that about 16% uh, about almost of the US uh, households were counted as poor during 2008 recession. So they have a very, you know, they set their standard higher of what is a poverty line. So if we define it correctly, we can use income as a measure, as a summary measure. Okay, because you have enough income for rent, you have enough income for shelter, food, you have enough income for everything. But where it's difficult to measure income, uh, which is actually the case in India, uh, because you have, uh, you know, many people in India self-employed. One day they earn 10 rupees, one day they earn 50. If you go to farmers, one season they earn more, one season they earn less. So it's very difficult to measure income. So in a society like that, you could use other indicators. And in fact, that is what, I can't go into it here in detail, but that is what is done in what is called the BPL classification. Some of you might have heard of this. Below poverty line and above poverty line. That is used for uh, like health insurance. If you're below poverty line, you pay a certain lower premium. If you're above poverty line, you pay more. I don't think, I don't know if it comes into scholarships, but it definitely comes into health care, uh, into other benefits like ration benefits. Now that definition of below poverty line is not based on income. It's based on a set of criteria, you know. 
there's a long list of criteria and how they are added up and ranked and there's a whole big discussion there but that's based on a set of criteria like you know do you have a proper house you know, do you have sanitation so the measures of standard of living if you like so that is a parallel thing which is going on 